boxing news. Ow! Okay, we'll start with this. Very recently, former unified lightweight champion Teofimo Lopez, on the eve of his ascent to the super lightweight division, took to social media and stated, Man, I asked for Jose Ramirez and all the top heads at 140. We're still discussing on the fighter. These fighters don't want nothing to do with me. Shaking my head. Twitch. Rick. Mirka! 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 You're a motherfucking liar. Send the contract now and I will go get it signed. He will fight you for free. I'm the wrong guy to bluff. Your manager is a friend. If he calls me and says you want that, I will run barefoot from California to Vegas to get it signed. Teofimo claims that Jose Ramirez, Josh Taylor, these guys are avoiding it. Along with the other top guys at 140 pounds and fighters, they don't always say rational things. Fighters themselves, they're sometimes irrational. And I think that Teofimo Lopez's comments here are somewhat irrational because we know that Jose Ramirez has a cushy spot by way of the WBO to challenge for the brown belt, the WBO title just as well. He's been in negotiations for a Conor Ben fight. We know those negotiations have since capsized. Per Rick Merrigan himself, Jose Ramirez's handler, in a nutshell, they didn't like the money that was on the table for the Conor Ben fight. But you see what I'm getting at? These guys that Teofimo's talking about, they're busy. Jose Ramirez, Josh Taylor. Josh Taylor is not at liberty at this time to entertain a fight with Teofimo Lopez because he's under orders by way of the WBC to face Jose Zapata. And Jose Zapata, that's no cherry. That's no walk in the park. That's a very experienced guy at 140 pounds. In fact, a guy like Jose Zapata would be a very credible scalp for Teofimo Lopez. Where do you get that Josh Taylor's ducking you by fighting him? What are you trying to say? He's a cherry pick and you're not? You're the guy moving up in weight. You're the guy that's coming right off a loss, a big upset loss to George Kambosos Jr. The truth is, now would be the most opportune time for a Josh Taylor or a Jose Ramirez to get Teofimo Lopez in. Now would be the most opportune time to jump on a Teofimo Lopez fight. Teofimo Lopez should be counting his lucky stars that he is fighting Pedro Campa in August instead of one of those fighters because a fight with one of those fighters at this point for him is a very risky fight. He's rebounding off the loss to George Kambosos Jr. We don't even know if he's in the right headspace right now. What we do know is he's being a bit irrational. Josh Taylor is not at liberty at this time to fight Teofimo Lopez because he's under orders by way of the WBC. Before that, he was under orders by way of the WBA and he had to vacate that title. You want him to vacate another one? You want he should chuck that title just to give you what you want? Who are you? Now this is what got Teofimo Lopez in hot water in the lightweight division. He was getting ahead of himself. Yeah, getting ahead of himself, worrying about the wrong things at the wrong time. Having conversations with Eddie Hearn about a potential Devin Haney fight when you know you're supposed to be fighting George Kambosos Jr. Before that, you took your eyes off the ball and it costed you. He needs to focus on rebounding off the loss, getting back to his winning ways. Not a foregone conclusion that Teofimo Lopez beats a Josh Taylor or a Jose Ramirez. It's not a foregone conclusion that he beats the upper echelon guys at 140 pounds. Remember a month ago, Kate Abdo sat down, conducted an interview with Teofimo Lopez, and he made some mention of angling for a Josh Taylor fight. This was before Josh Taylor vacated the WBA title when he was still this division's undisputed disputed champion and I said it then he's not gonna be Josh Taylor's next opponent Taylor versus Lopez it ain't next Teofimo's not in line for that fight by way of all four alphabet sanctioning bodies there are one or two guys ahead of him in the queue and he doesn't just get to cut ahead in the line because he wants to and when he doesn't get what he wants that doesn't mean he's being avoided that means he's got to wait his turn more importantly He's got to get himself back in the winner's bracket before he starts worrying about challenging for world titles. It's good that Teofimo Lopez is hungry. It's good that he wants these big fights with these big names at 140 pounds because in a short amount of time, he won't have to go looking for them. They'll come looking for him. How do you think those guys are looking at him right now? These battle-tested 140-pound fighters and former champions. How do you think they're looking at Teofimo Lopez right now that he's coming off a loss and moving up in weight. I'm telling you, in a little while, he won't have to go looking for them. They'll come looking for him. The only one I can really beat Tank is only me. I guess I gotta do it. When you, what, nobody you can, nobody could do the job, when man. I gotta do it. All right, man, he knows what's up. He a free agent, ain't he? All right, we make it happen. Come to ESPN. Now, we all know that Gervonta Davis isn't about to do that. 
I've said it many times before and I'll say it again here and now. He's not going to cross over to the top rank ESPN side of things so that he has to work for his money. He's not going to go to top rank. He's not going to go to ESPN. You know, I don't think that Teofimo Lopez or the winner of Haney versus Combosos, really anybody that isn't on the Mayweather Promotions side of the street, I don't think anybody should entertain a fight with Javante Davis. After all, according to Leonard Ellerby, He's too good for everybody. He's the star that shines the brightest at or around these weights. So let him keep busy with the Isaac Cruises and Roly Romeros of the world. You go name dropping this guy in interviews. It's not going to result in a fight. Nothing's going to happen. And all they're going to do is accuse you of clout chasing him. As if he has something you want. I can only tell you now what I told you before. Javante Davis has the potential to be a bigger draw than he already is. But so long as they're keeping everything in house, that puts a cap on his potential. The big fights that he could have, the kind of fights that might sell well over 300,000 buys. Maybe five, maybe six. Leonard Ellaby doesn't want to pay to play. You know, Teofimo Lopez, he's calling the guy out, but we all know that Javante Davis isn't going anywhere. He's going to stay at Mayweather Promotions, and so long as he's there, Mayweather Promotions isn't going to pay these guys what they weigh. He's not going to pay these guys what they're worth. I'm not telling you that Teofimo Lopez is as big a draw as a Javante Davis, but he is a bigger draw than a Roly Romero, a bigger draw than an Isaac Cruz, and if they don't pay him like he is... Pay him? They won't even make him an offer. There's no point in calling out Javante Davis for a fight. There really isn't. There is no reason to do it. It's a waste of time. He's not in possession of any full-fledged alphabet titles at this time. All he's got is a secondary title in the lightweight division. He's got no full-fledged titles there or in the super lightweight division. 140 pounds. And if all he's going to do is fight his PBC and Mayweather Promotions stablemates, then let him. Don't even fucking bother calling him out. In men's welterweight news, for a tweet from Mike Coppinger via his sauces, Errol Spence Jr. and Terrence Crawford are closing in on a deal for an undisputed welterweight championship fight in October in Las Vegas. Sources tell ESPN, no agreement yet, but no real stumbling blocks either. PBC pay-per-view for this genuine super fight. What can this fight do commercially? I think between 400,000 and 500,000 pay-per-view buys. I think. Because this is a fight that fight fans have actually been asking for for some time. Because this isn't a substitute or an alternative like Spence versus Yugos or Spence versus Porter, Crawford versus Porter. Because this is the fight that many people have wanted for some time. I expect this fight to do better commercially than any fight Spence has been a part of in the past and Terrence Crawford as well. Conventionally, Errol Spence Jr.'s numbers hover around north of 200,000 buys. Terrence just put up his best numbers with Sean Porter, a little over 130,000 buys. 225 to 250 from Errol, another 130 from Terrence Crawford, and an additional, let's say, 100,000 from the Synergy that their fight creates, the way it can take on a life of its own. If it's promoted properly on the Showtime platform. Hell, maybe it won't even be Showtime that does the fight. Maybe it'll be Fox. Maybe they're the ones footing the bill. It's not like they've been spending a fuck ton of money on their boxing programming this year. They haven't. Neither Errol Spence Jr. or Terrence Crawford command the kind of purses that a Canelo Alvarez does. You ain't gotta give either one of these two guys $40 million a fight. You don't. That brings the operational cost. When the guaranteed purses to the fighters aren't astronomical and the operational costs are low. The financial risks associated with putting a fight on, they're not as risky. And the break-even point is that much easier to hit. I think, I think with the with proper, proper promotion, promotion this, this fight could do as high as 400 to 500,000 pay-per-view buys. I don't know about a million. I don't rule it out, though it seems like a stretch because piracy is rampant in today's boxing environment. And that piracy cuts right into the profit margin, cuts right into the buy rate of a pay-per-view. There's a lot of people out there They're just one click away from watching a fight for free on their laptop. So you do have to factor that into the equation as well. Unfortunately, you do. But Terrence and Errol will get my money if and when they get this fight over the line. And as far as the fight, my prediction hasn't changed. Errol Spence Jr., a crafty southpaw with a high work rate and a strong punch. Well, there's a reason he wanted to save Terrence for last, isn't it? At minimum, you must acknowledge that a fight with Terrence is a riskier fight than any fight Errol has taken on so far. It's a riskier fight 
then a Mikey Garcia fight, then a Danny Garcia fight, then a Ugas fight, then a Porter fight. Errol comes into most fights with certain advantages. But he has generous physical dimensions for a welterweight, that he's a strong puncher with a high work rate, and he's a southpaw. He won't have that southpaw advantage over Terrence Crawford because Terrence is a switch hitter. He's ambidextrous. He can lead with the right hand or the left. Uh, yeah, Errol's got a good jab, and it does fluster most orthodox fighters. Those southpaws, they can be tricky, but Terrence Crawford, he can be a southpaw when he wants to be as well. Pot shotting from the outside to cut a guy's work rate down. A guy like Errol Spence Jr., who has a very high work rate. Cut a guy's work rate down the same way he cut Sean Porter's work rate down. You'll notice that Sean Porter landed a lot more punches on Errol Spence Jr. than what he landed on Terrence Crawford. Look at the punch stats. That tells the story. Sean Porter was able to land something like 172 punches on Errol Spence Jr. He landed less than half the punches on Terrence Crawford, and it's not by accident. It's by design. Pivots and shifts with hooks on the turn. Errol Spence Jr. isn't as fleet of foot as Terrence Crawford. He's not. At his best, Errol Spence Jr. is front foot heavy, unloading that artillery of his. And that might work on a Yodogany Stugas. That might work on a Sean Porter, a Danny Garcia, a Mikey Garcia. That might work on lesser fighters than Terrence Crawford, who are not as versatile as Terrence Crawford. Who want ambidextrous, like Terrence Crawford. And who don't have the mean streak that Terrence Crawford has. Strong finishers like Terrence Crawford because Terrence Crawford as a welterweight has proven to be a strong finisher. I told you guys over two years ago, Terrence Crawford would be the first man to stop Sean Porter. And before that, I told you beforehand, Errol Spence Jr. couldn't stop Mikey and he's not gonna stop Sean. Terrence Crawford, that's another matter. He's got what it takes to deal with a come forward aggressive pressure fighter. And if Errol Spence Jr. attempts to be aggressive, come forward and apply pressure, Terrence will likely pot shot him from the outside and break him down round after round. I'm not saying it's gonna be easy. So that Terrence won't come under threat of heavy fire. Errol Spence Jr., you know, he did fracture Ugas's orbital bone. That's the story, right? Yeah, maybe he did, but Ugas ain't Terrence Crawford. Maybe it's better that it happened that way. So there will be no excuses in October when both men share the squared circle. No worries about lingering injuries from the car accident or detached retinas. No excuses. I half expected to see Terrence Crawford return beforehand, perhaps against a Keith Thurman. But, you know, as it stands, Keith's stuck without a dance partner, and that's just his fucking problem. Oh, fucking well. You better find somebody to fight. You know, I don't think Errol's a bad fighter. I think he's a solid fighter. Strong puncher. He's got some tools, don't get me wrong. But he's not as nuanced or streamlined as Terrence Crawford. What seems to work for Errol is that he's got some size and he's got some power. Good body attack, and he's a prolific puncher, a volume puncher, and, you know, he's a southpaw. And I think a good chunk of Errol's success you can attribute to him being a southpaw with these other properties. But Terrence Crawford is the one guy that can take that advantage away. Slow the fight down and pot shot from the outside, pivoting and shifting. Walking Errol into straight shots, walking Errol into hooks on the turn. And I don't think Errol takes the best punch. I saw him get rattled by Sean Porter, a non-puncher. I saw Sean touch him to the body, get his attention and hurt him. I saw Sean come over with a looping shot. I saw Sean rattle him. I saw Ugas do it too. Those guys aren't strong finishers. Terrence Crawford is. Now, I don't really give a shit who you pick to win this fight, to be honest. I'm just happy it's finally happening. Well, I don't think it should have taken this long. At least it's here. And finally, in men's light heavyweight news, per tweet from Michael Benson, the WBC have now ordered Callum Smith versus Matthew Bowderleek as a final eliminator for the WBC light heavyweight world title, according to Eddie Hearn. Winner would be WBC mandatory challenger for the winner of Artur Betterbeef versus Joe Smith Jr. on June 18th. And there you see... Eddie's making waves for Bob again. By way of the mandatory process, the way he did two or three years ago with Anthony Krola. Oh. Anthony Krola, who was Vasil Lomachenko's mandatory challenger by way of the WBA. What Eddie Hearn wanted in that situation was to bring... Vasil Lomachenko over to the DAZN side of things. Good to Bobby ended up overpaying Anthony Crowley to keep the fight on ESPN. Eddie Hearn aspired to do that again with Devin Haney back when Devin Haney was Vasil Lomachenko's mandatory challenger, but Bob and the Lomachenko people petition for franchise status and franchise champions don't have mandatories. He may have to do the same thing for the winner of this fight, lest he find himself in a purse bid situation 
with the people over there at the Matchroom, the winner of our tour, Better Beef versus Joe Smith Jr. Well, let's not get ahead of ourselves. Callum Smith's got to win the fight first. Callum Smith is Eddie Hearn's horse in the race, and Callum is going to be taking on Matthew Bowder League, French Olympian, French bronze medalist in the light heavyweight division of sports, a professional record of 21 wins, one loss with 12 knockouts. He's been stopped at least once. Could get stopped again doing the dance with Callum. You see what Callum did to Lennon Castillo. Hit the goddamn guy so hard he went into a seizure. For perspective, Lennon Castillo had never been stopped, and he's a very big guy as far as light heavyweights go. Both boys were in action in September of last year. Callum was in action against Lennon, and Matthew Bowderleek was in action against Igor Mikalkin. For an Olympic bronze medalist, Matthew Bowderleek really hasn't made a splash. He didn't create the buzz that these Olympians often create when they decide to go pro. For the most part, Matthew Bowderleek has been flying relatively low in the light heavyweight radar. When it comes to Callum. Now, Callum Smith has paired up with former world champion, veteran trainer, Buddy McGirt. He's got a strong corner. And I think we saw the benefits of having Buddy McGirt in his corner in that Lennon Castillo fight. The way he stopped that guy. He lands that way on anybody at 175 pounds. They're going down. This is a WBC eliminator to crown WBC's mandatory challenger. But whoever wins the fight, presumably Callum Smith, they will still have to wait. Ahead of them is Anthony Yard by way of the WBO. And even though the fight, the WBO obviously hasn't ordered that fight yet. But after the winner of Better Beef versus Smith emerges, it's conceivable that either Frank Warren or Bob Arum or both will put the squeeze on Paco to order that fight. At which point, the winner of Smith versus Bowder Leak, they're gonna have to wait. I don't anticipate the winner of Smith versus Bowder Leak gets a crack at any one of those belts until sometime mid to late next year. Plenty of time for Uncle Bob to petition for franchise status for either Joe Smith Jr. or Artur Better Beef to put the kibosh on Eddie Hearn's potential plans to bring that champion and bring that fight over to the zone.